This time we'll introduce quadratic forms and matrix norms. Let's start by defining what a quadratic form is, and then we'll explore some consequences of this definition. A quadratic form is a function f from rn to r of the form x transpose ax for some particular square matrix A. So f is a function that takes any vector x in rn as an input and spits out a scalar as an output, and this scalar is just x transpose ax. It's called a quadratic form because x appears twice in this matrix vector product. I've also written it out as a sum of the elements of a and of x, just to remind you of what the matrix vector multiplication is actually doing here. One immediate consequence of this definition is that the particular choice of a for a given quadratic form is not unique. This makes sense because the function takes a vector, several variables, and maps it to a scalar, just one variable there's going to be a lot of redundancy. Now, since x transpose ax is a scalar, the transpose of the whole product is equal to itself. If we just distribute the transpose, we get this, and the transposes on the last x cancel. Let's move that last line up and make some room. Now we're going to use a trick. We'll add the same thing to both sides. Specifically, we're going to add x transpose ax to both sides. The left-hand side is just twice of the same thing, so the left-hand side becomes 2x transpose ax, and we can simplify the right-hand side using the distributive property. Now I'm just going to divide both sides by 2. So this is interesting. The right-hand side is just another quadratic form, but the matrix here is a transpose plus a divided by 2, which is also a square matrix with the same dimensions as a. We didn't make any assumptions about the vector x, so for any x at all, the left and right hand sides are the same. Whether you use a, or whether you use a transpose plus a over 2, the output of the quadratic form is the same scalar value. The matrix a transpose plus a over 2 is equal to its own transpose, and it's called the symmetric part of a. Note that an infinite number of matrices have the same symmetric part. With a little thought, you should be able to come up with a simple method to easily create different matrices that all have the same symmetric part. From the math we just did, we see that when we're working with quadratic forms, we can assume the matrix A is symmetric without loss of generality. That means we don't limit or restrict the validity of our future derivations by assuming A is symmetric. Okay, so why do we care? Why am I going on and on about symmetric matrices? Well. If we're working with a real symmetric matrix, we can apply the spectral theorem. And that's exactly what we're going to do. One quick piece of info I'll mention now is that given some scalar a, the set of vectors x that satisfy x transpose ax is less than or equal to a is a quadratic region. On the other hand, if instead the condition is equality, then we get a quadratic surface. So this will look familiar from the last lecture. But actually, an ellipsoid is a special case of a quadratic region. Not all quadratic regions are ellipsoids. We've still got to find that other special property, and that's where we'll head next. So again, let's assume our matrix A is real and symmetric. Then, via the spectral theorem, x transpose AX equals x transpose Q lambda Q transpose X, where, as usual, Q is an orthogonal matrix whose columns are the eigenvectors of A, and lambda is a diagonal matrix with the corresponding eigenvalues of A sitting along the main diagonal. Note that it's perfectly legal for us to apply the transpose operation twice to the product x transpose q, so we get this nice expression here. Now the part before lambda is just the transpose of the part after lambda. It's basically another quadratic form. Let's write this product out as a sum because it's clearer that way. Take a minute to study this here. Qi is the ith column of Q, and it's also the ith eigenvector of A. So Qi transpose x is a scalar, and we're squaring it, so it's always going to be non-negative. This non-negative number is multiplied by lambda i, the ith eigenvalue of A. Now lambda i might be positive or negative or zero. Now imagine we've sorted the eigenvalues in descending order such that lambda 1 is the greatest and lambda n is the least. We can also assume this without loss of generality, because we can always swap the columns of Q and the entries of lambda to achieve this ordering without changing the original matrix A. 
So that means the following inequality must hold. We've just replaced lambda i with lambda 1. So in every term of this sum, we're always using lambda 1. Since lambda 1 is the greatest eigenvalue, and qi transpose x squared is always non-negative, this new sum must always be greater than or equal to the previous sum for any x. Let's clean that up and make some room again. So now we're going to use another clever trick. We're basically going to go backwards. We're going to rewrite the sum as a matrix expression. It's just like the expression we started with, except the matrix lambda is now replaced by the scalar lambda 1 times the identity matrix. In other words, we've just replaced every element along the main diagonal of the matrix lambda with the greatest eigenvalue. We can pull lambda 1 out since it's just a scalar, and the identity matrix disappears into the product. Now we just distribute the transpose, and here we see an old friend, q times q transpose. I don't need to remind you that q is orthogonal, so this is just the identity matrix. And we're left with this satisfying expression, lambda 1 x transpose x. Finally, remember that x transpose x is just the square of the norm of x. Summarizing everything, we've arrived at this simple inequality. x transpose ax is less than or equal to lambda 1 times the square of the norm of x. Again, no matter what x we use, this inequality holds. If we go through the same derivation again, but instead we make an inequality using lambda n, the smallest eigenvalue, we'll get a similar inequality x transpose ax is greater than or equal to lambda n times the square of the norm of x. We've just flipped the inequality and replaced lambda 1 with lambda n. We can write this together as one big inequality. x transpose ax will always lie between these two expressions. Think for a moment what this means geometrically. Given some real symmetric matrix A, if I make a quadratic form using it, then for any input vector x, the output of the quadratic form will always lie between the norm squared of that input vector scaled by the biggest and smallest eigenvalues. The biggest and smallest eigenvalues give me a range within which the output of the quadratic form is guaranteed to lie. Now by convention, instead of writing lambda 1 for the biggest eigenvalue, sometimes we write lambda max for clarity. Similarly, sometimes we denote lambda n by lambda min instead. And as mentioned before, Assuming that the eigenvalues are ordered doesn't place any additional restrictions on the validity of the inequality we've derived. We can always just rearrange the diagonal entries of lambda as long as we also rearrange the corresponding columns of q, which are just the corresponding eigenvectors. If we use our new matrix lambda and our new matrix q, then the product q lambda q transpose will still equal our original matrix A. Now we're prepared to introduce some terminology that you'll often see in real papers across lots of different fields, from machine learning to quantum mechanics. A real symmetric matrix is called positive semidefinite, or PSD, if x transpose ax is greater than or equal to zero for all x in Rn. People often use the notation a is greater than or equal to zero, or they'll use this weird symbol that looks like a curvy version of the inequality sign. The curvy greater than sign is read succeeds, so the symbol you see here is read a succeeds or is equal to zero. If you saw a curvy less than sign, you'd read it as precedes. It looks kind of fancy, but personally, I prefer to use the ordinary greater than and less than signs because it removes the mystique that surrounds vectors and matrices. Going way back to the beginning of this lecture series, that's why we use ordinary letters for vector variables instead of using boldface letters or writing little arrows on top. Now if you combine this definition with the inequality we derived on the last slide, you'll see this definition implies that lambda min must be non-negative. That's a fact you'll want to keep in the back of your mind as you watch the rest of this video. Lambda min is non-negative for PSD matrices. Here's a related term. A real symmetric matrix is called positive definite if x transpose ax is greater than zero for all x. All we've done is replace the greater than or equal to sign with a strict greater than sign. We denote this as a greater than zero or a succeeds zero. As you can guess, we can just flip the inequality and produce more terminology. We call a negative semidefinite if negative a is greater than or equal to zero. We call a negative definite if negative a is positive definite. And if a is any of the above, if it's any of those four terms, 
then we say A is definite. A quadratic form that involves a definite matrix is called a definite quadratic form. Finally, if A is not definite, then we just say that A is indefinite. So we can use definite quadratic forms in what are called matrix inequalities. When we write A is greater than or equal to B, what we really mean is that A minus B is positive semi-definite. This is how you interpret matrix inequalities. It turns out that many scalar inequalities also hold for matrices. This explains why we use the inequality symbol directly with matrices. In computer science lingo, we're overloading the inequality symbol. It tempts us to treat matrix inequalities like scalar inequalities, and sometimes that actually works. Here are some simple examples. If A is greater than or equal to B, and C is greater than or equal to D, then A plus C is greater than or equal to B plus D. If B is less than or equal to zero, then A plus B is less than or equal to A. We could find many other examples, but we can only carry this analogy so far. That's because matrix inequality is a partial order, which means that some real symmetric matrices cannot be compared. Specifically, this means that it's possible for A not to be greater than or equal to B, and for A not to be less than or equal to B, to both be true statements. In this case, we say these two matrices are incomparable. So let's be careful when we see a matrix inequality. We can't just treat matrices like scalars. Now that we know about definiteness, we can finally see what special property we need to define ellipsoids. If A is a real symmetric matrix that's also positive definite, then the set of all vectors x and rn, such that x transpose ax is less than or equal to 1, is an ellipsoid in rn centered at the origin. So the reason we need the matrix A to be positive definite is that it means x transpose ax is greater than 0. So if we're explicit about the conditions, it means x transpose ax is greater than 0, but less than or equal to 1. Now you see how this makes the set of vectors bounded. If the matrix A were not positive definite, and we only required x transpose ax to be less than or equal to 1, then there would be no lower bound on x transpose ax. That means if we had some vector x that made x transpose ax equal some negative scalar, then 10 times x would also satisfy the inequality, and 100 times x would also satisfy the inequality, and we could keep making x longer and longer without bound. So if we plotted this set of vectors, it would be a quadratic region, but there would be no boundary, no closed shape. However, by requiring the matrix A to be positive definite, we have both a lower bound and an upper bound on the output of this quadratic form. So the set of vectors forms a closed shape, an ellipsoid. And just to finish the story of ellipsoids, the semi-axes are given by each eigenvector divided by the square root of the corresponding eigenvalue. Just to refresh your memory, the semi-axes of this three-dimensional ellipsoid are shown here as A, B, and C. Again, since the matrix A is positive definite, all eigenvalues are positive, so the square root is always defined. Now if the matrix were positive semi-definite, that would be a problem. Do you see why? It's because for PSD matrices, an eigenvalue could be zero, so we'd be dividing by zero here. That would correspond to a semi-axis of infinite length, so the shape wouldn't be bounded along that direction. That's why we strictly require the matrix to be positive definite. So at this point, we've got a good understanding of quadratic forms. Now we'll move on to a related topic, matrix norms. Many different matrix norms have been defined, but for our purposes, we just need to discuss two, the operator norm and the Frobenius norm. The operator norm, or the spectral norm, of a matrix is defined as the maximum value of norm AX divided by norm X. The norm on the right-hand side is the ordinary vector norm we've always been using. So this max notation means that we take every possible value of the vector x, except for the zero vector, and one at a time, we create the vector ax, then we take the ratio of the norm of ax to the norm of x. That ratio is just a scalar. We repeat this for every possible vector x, and we find the greatest value. That value is the operator norm of a. We use the same norm symbol for the operator norm and the vector norm. You'll have to tell the difference by considering the context. If there's a matrix inside, it's the operator norm. Also, note that the operator norm is defined for any arbitrary matrix. 
It doesn't need to be square or PSD or anything. So this notation can seem a little mysterious, but just remember it's shorthand for this process I just described. If you think about what this means geometrically, x is the input vector and ax is the output vector. Norm x is the length of the input vector and norm ax is the length of the output vector. So norm ax over norm x is just the amount of stretching that a does to the input vector. a may also change the direction of x, but we don't care about that here. We just care about how much the vector's length gets stretched or compressed. Then the operator norm is just the maximum scaling that the matrix A applies to any input vector. In electrical engineering lingo, they often call this the gain of the matrix. So this norm is fairly intuitive, but of course there are an infinite number of different vectors x we have to try, so it's impossible to actually perform this procedure. But let's approach this mathematically, and surprisingly we'll end up with a simple closed form solution. We're going to start by squaring the expression we're maximizing. Now, we're changing the expression by doing this, but the square is a monotonic increasing function. So the x that maximizes this new expression will also be the same x that maximizes the original expression on the last slide. Of course, the value at the maximum will be different, but the input vector that corresponds to the maximum will be the same for both expressions. We actually use the same trick in the least squares lecture. So we squared the expression because it lets us get rid of the norms. We can write norm squared as the transpose of a vector with itself. If we just distribute the transpose in the numerator, we see something interesting. x transpose a transpose ax. This should ring a bell. It's a quadratic form with a transpose a as its matrix. Now here's a key insight. Without loss of generality, we can assume x is a unit vector. Why? Because if we multiply x by some scalar, that scalar will show up twice in the denominator and twice in the numerator, so it'll cancel. No matter what scalar we use, it won't show up in this expression at all. So we can normalize x to be a unit vector without changing the value of this expression. So what's the unit vector that maximizes this expression? If you think carefully, you'll realize it's just the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of the matrix A transpose A. If the eigenvalues are sorted, then this vector is just q1. Now this notation here might be confusing. This isn't lambda1 times a transpose a. It's lambda1 of the matrix a transpose a. So really you should think of this as lambda1 times q1 transpose q1. We use this function notation with lambda1 because it makes it clear which matrix we're getting the eigenvalue for. If we just wrote lambda1, that might look cleaner but then you might not be sure whether we're talking about lambda 1 for a transpose a, or lambda 1 for just a. You'd have to figure it out from context, but this notation removes that ambiguity. So anyway, we've got lambda 1 q1 transpose q1 over q1 transpose q1. Well, the q1s all cancel out, so we just get lambda 1. Remember that we can also call this lambda max for emphasis. However, remember that we've been working with the square of our original expression, so now we should take the square roots of both sides. Summarizing everything into one clean line, here's our result. The operator norm is the square root of the largest eigenvalue of A transpose A. I don't know about you, but I think that this is so satisfying. So clean, you know. And just like we did for quadratic forms, we can use similar logic to find the minimum gain. The minimum value of the same expression is just the square root of the smallest eigenvalue of A transpose A. Now you might be wondering, is this square root always defined? Well it is. We can show that the minimum gain is always real and non-negative for any matrix. Here's how. The matrix A transpose A is symmetric. You can easily verify this yourself by taking the transpose of the entire product. A transpose A is also PSD since the quadratic form X transpose A transpose AX is the same as the norm squared of AX and norms must always be non-negative. So by the definition of PSD, this means the smallest eigenvalue of A transpose A is non-negative. So lambda max must also be non-negative. This means the operator norm and the minimum gain must always be non-negative. So now we know what the operator norm is. But what are some of its properties? Actually, the operator norm shares many properties with the ordinary vector norm. For example, for any scalar C, the operator norm of C A is just the absolute value of c times the operator norm of a. The triangle inequality also holds for the operator norm. If a and b are matrices, 
then the operator norm of a plus b is less than or equal to the operator norm of a plus the operator norm of b. Here's another one. The operator norm of a is equal to the operator norm of a transpose. You know this also trivially holds for vectors. And if the operator norm of a matrix is zero, then every element of a must be zero. Finally, the operator and vector norms are identical if the matrix is a vector. Here's what I mean. Let a be a vector. If I just plug in a into the operator norm definition, here's what I get. The operator norm is the square root of the largest eigenvalue of the matrix a transpose a. But a transpose a is just a scalar. If I multiply a transpose a by any vector, I'm just going to get the same vector back, but it will be scaled by a transpose a. That means a transpose a is the one and only eigenvalue of a transpose a. It's trivial, and also dumb, but also kind of brilliant. Since a transpose a is just the norm squared of a, I end up with just the vector norm of a as my final answer. So the operator norm just reduces to the vector norm. In this way, we can think of the operator norm as the generalization of the vector norm. That's pretty neat. So much about the operator norm. We'll wrap up by briefly introducing the Frobenius norm. The Frobenius norm is defined by this simple expression. For any arbitrary matrix A, we just square all the elements of A, add them all up together, then take the square root. We end up with a single scalar. That's it. Here's a fact you might want to know. For a given matrix, the operator norm is always less than or equal to the Frobenius norm. In some applications, it might be easier to work with the Frobenius norm. For example, we might want to minimize the operator norm of the matrix A, but that might be really hard to achieve in closed form. However, if we find some closed form way to minimize the Frobenius norm, then we know that we've at least placed an upper bound on the operator norm. So this fact sometimes comes in handy. There's actually another way to write the Frobenius norm that's sometimes more helpful. To understand it though, we need to introduce something called the trace of a square matrix. The trace is just the sum of the elements along the main diagonal. Super easy. Just be careful, because this is only defined for square matrices. So here we go. The Frobenius norm is equal to the square root of the trace of A transpose A. Very clean, right? It's really interesting how A transpose A shows up over and over again. It's a good exercise to verify that this expression for the Frobenius norm is equivalent to the definition given on the last slide. Seriously, give it a try. Anyway, that's everything for this lecture. So we've learned about quadratic forms and matrix norms, and soon you'll see why we need them. Next time we'll introduce the singular value decomposition, the last topic of this series. We're finally ready.